Hi, my name is Yeshu Vijay Kumar, and I'm a Senior Engineering Manager at Adobe, specifically with the Adobe Experience Platform. Um, and within it, in the Unified Profile team. Today's talk is going to be about massive data processing in Adobe using Dental Lake. With respect to the agenda, we will start off with what are we trying to store and what problem are we solving for? First, we will present challenges that are there and uh, we will talk about strategies and approaches that we are going to take to mitigate them. And time permitting, we will also want to share um, the performances from the changes that we have made. Before we go any further, we need to understand what the data flow looks like uh, for the solution that we're talking about. Uh, so we have a lot of internal solutions um, and external, um, like Adobe Campaign, which is a marketing solution for uh, e email campaigns. Uh, we have AEM, which is used for website building. We also have Adobe Analytics. It's one of the largest uh, analytics solutions uh, that are that's available to, today. Uh, and solutions like Adobe Ad Cloud, which is used for uh, advertising optimizations. Uh, so we have a lot of marketing data that's flowing in on a per tenant basis. Uh, and when we say tenant uh, throughout the talk, it refers to an individual client. Uh, Adobe itself can be one of them, or can be treated as one of the clients. Um, so we have data flowing in in various formats. So every event, every CRM record, a lot of different uh, data is flowing in. It can be in JSON format, in Parquet, or Protobuf, or bring whatever you want to. Uh, all of this is converted into a JSON format, specifically the experience data model. This is a standardized JSON schema that we use to represent uh, the business objects for marketing use cases. Uh, this gets into the unified profile. Uh, this is a large, uh, a global scale hot store, uh, which is a single tenant system system. So every client that is every ten tenant gets their own cost of customers to be. Um, once it's fed into that, we generate a change feed notification. That is CDC messages that go into um, a change feed, uh, a Kafka firehose. And this firehose is a multi-tenant topic. Um, uh, this in turn feeds into, you know, uh, structured streaming, uh, statistics applications, or stats generation or other processes, which can, as in, for example, geo replication, going to the edge, etc. So this is what we're dealing with with respect to the data, data flow. Uh, one important thing to understand is uh, the unified profile as such, it lets you get a 360 degree view of uh, your customer, that is your customer profile. Uh, an important part of it is the identity linkages. So you could have multiple identities like anonymous, known, can, coming from online data, offline data. All of this is tied together in the identity graph generator, which, uh, which basically gives you a bunch of uh, related identities, which makes sense of the graph or the cluster for you. Uh, so this is a very important part uh, to understand the data because this, for every record that we store, this is the effective foreign key that is uh, tell, 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 telling us which other records are linked to this single record. If we were to oversimplify the problem, uh, we can try to dump it down to a layout like this. Uh, in this ex ex example, the primary ID refers to uh, the identifier that actually generated a direct record. This could be a cookie ID, an email ID, etc. Uh, the related IDs is literally the graph that we just spoke about. Uh, field ones to 1000, this, this, this can be any number of fields. Every tenant has its own schema. So it's basically a bunch of data associated with uh, that record per se. It could be an event, uh, it could be a CRM record indicating like, you know, name, age, et cetera. Um, so yeah, so the main thing to look out for from this example is the last two lines. Uh, ID 789, uh, what basically these two records indicate to us is that ID 789 is linked to 101. 
And then you can see that there is another linkage from uh, for all the records in 101, they are linked to 789 and 101. Uh, one key thing to note is primary ID is not a primary key here. It's just the ID that generated the record. The related ID basically tells us what are the ones that is related to. Now this out of the way, let's uh, look at a scenario where a new record comes in. Uh, the new record comes in basically indicates a change in the graph membership. So let's say uh, we get a record which links 1103 with ID, IDs 789 and 101. So this is an example of how such a record might be. Uh, now this would cause a cascading change in all the rows of 789 and 101. Because say if you have 100 rows between both of them, we have to go and update all 100 rows. So this is the end result that it would look like, where you can see like every single instance of 103, 789, and 101 have been updated with the new uh, related ID changes. Now that we have talked a bit about uh, simplified data uh, that we have, let's also talk about the main access pattern. Uh, the main uh, problem that we're trying to solve right now is we want to run multiple queries over one consolidated mode. Now, for when you look at it from a Spark query point of view, it kind of looks something like this. We want to take the raw records, let's load them into a data frame. We would first do a group by on the related IDs field. So all the records that are linked uh, to the identities in the graph for a given cluster, uh, they will be assimilated together. So that is what you would see in the, uh, in the, the parameters for the map partitions. So we get a handle on the related IDs, which is the key, and the list of values in records. Now, once we have gotten a handle on top of this, we want to execute queries using our custom engine, uh, which is a high performance segmentation engine uh, to execute a bunch of queries, uh, to run thousands of queries on top of uh, a single record. Um, and then these results will be saved to a sync. The sync can be a hot store, a cold store, uh, anything. Uh, one key point to keep in mind is uh, a lot of people will be like, Hey, why don't you just write SQL queries, right? So the biggest problem over here would be like if we took the SQL way of executing it, right? Uh, if you had to do a thousand queries, even with let's say fast scheduling, uh, with Spark and so on, at max, say you would analyze one to three queries or so on. So, but there's no way you're going to execute all one thousand queries at the same time uh, with, with Spark or whatever. Uh, magic tool that they found. So this is a highly optimized query engine that has been built uh, for this very purpose and also supports a lot of different uh, uh, complicated use cases. Like you could specify a query like, hey, give me all the people who uh, did a trial of Illustrator in the last seven days and uh, added Photoshop to cart but did not purchase it yet. So. Uh, Complexity wise and uh, latency wise, it's very sensitive. Now let's look at other complexities with respect to, you know, executing this use case. Uh, nest, like I said, our data with the XCM JSON, uh, since we are relying on JSON schema per se, we have a lot of nested fields. You can have A dot B dot C dot D and blah, blah, blah. So the nestedness is extremely complicated. Uh, we have arrays on top of it, which uh, makes query execution and data, data fetching extremely expensive. Uh, also add to the fact that we have map types, which uh, is like a Pandora's box. Uh, so query planning wise, it makes things very difficult. Uh, and also when you take uh, a schema like this in Spark, you're going to be talking um, like an extremely large schema object in memory. Uh, adding to this is every 10 10 and our client has a different schema. And then and plus the schema evolves constantly. Fields can get deleted, updated. 
uh, we try to keep things moving in a forward facing fashion, but then uh, clients always uh, experiment. So that assumption always does not hold good. Another big problem is multiple source sources. So we have sources coming from streaming, batch, or even like say point uh, API changes, uh, which can cause issues. Now, what scale are we talking about, right? Like a lot of this can possibly just be solved, just throw everything into Postgres, normalize some tables and be done with it, right? Uh, but yeah, the problem is uh, the tenants have tens to multiple tens of build buildings and rows. Uh, we have hundreds of ten tenants. Uh, and overall, this maps to petabytes of data across various data centers across the world. Uh, with respect to streaming loads, because we're talking about event traffic, right? Just retail traffic can make things very difficult. Uh, million plus RPS uh, peaking across the system at uh, any given time. And also these data points that are ingested, they trigger multiple downstream applications, like segmentation, activation, like email sending, uh, push notifications, etc. So complicated enough. Uh, yeah. So where does Delta Lake come in, right? So we've spent quite some time talking about uh, the problem as such. So before we go into the solution, right? So uh, we need to understand a bit about what Delta Lake is. So Delta Lake is an open source project from Databricks. Uh, uh, it basically enables the implementation of a lake house architecture on top of existing storage systems um, like S3, ADLS, et cetera. Uh, the key features of this, right, uh, are basically the main thing coming from this is asset transactions on top of um, a data lake or like a system like uh, S3 and ADLS. Uh, we basically get asset transactions um, on the rights. Uh, for the rights specifically, we get uh, optimistic concurrency control. Uh, this makes sure that even if you have multiple writers, right, from say not, not even the same cluster, multiple clusters, uh, you're able to safely write uh, star, star, star with some conditions uh, to the data rate at the same time concurrently. Uh, so this may, and the reader and the reader can get uh, a safe version or uh, a safe snapshot uh, irrespective of how many writers are writing to it. Uh, the next uh, big feature that comes from it is the time travel feature. So you can say like, hey, give me the, uh, the version as of three days back. So you, get, you can get a snapshot version of the table uh, multiple days back or even hours back. And given the fact that we have transactions, right? So if something fails, it rolls back automatically. So every time the transaction is committed, you get a new snapshot version, so which makes things good. The other thing, other nice thing about it, it uses Parquet and underneath. So Delta Lake does not reinvent or create a new uh, storage format. Um, Parquet does have some, uh, uh, some give givings, some misgivings, mainly because its header format is pretty limited. Uh, but Delta Lake makes up for it by maintaining its own metadata, uh, but it uses Parquet and Delta. Uh, so that's a very good piece. It also has schema enforcement and schema evolution, uh, which makes it a very good uh, thing, specifically even if you have your own cat cat catalog. Uh, like the transactions plus the time travel, it also gives you a bit of auditing. Uh, which helps you track down which writer made which change on the table and so on. The biggest thing uh, of, of this whole thing is that uh, you get updates and then delete support. Uh, what does that mean? We'll see that in the next slide right now. This is probably a big game changer because you're going to be able to, if someone told you, oh, hey, can you do uh, uh, updates and deletes on top of Parquet, it will be like, well, I want to, but it would be great if you can get something uh, reliable to do it. So Delta Lake in practice, right? Uh, for those who are familiar with Spark, uh, instead of using Spark or B dot form format of Parquet, you just specify Delta and you can load any existing Parquet also uh, into the data frame or the data set. For writing, it's the exact same thing. You just use dot format of Delta instead of dot Parquet. Now coming to the upsert, right? 
Now, this is probably the game changing part that I was talking about. It lets you have uh, there's a SQL version of this too, which exposes the merge into command. What this piece of code is actually doing is we're loading in a data frame for, with the EP events. And then we're also loading in an updates data frame, which have been staged updates. Now, if the updates uh, event ID matches with the events table event ID, that is the parent table, in that case, when it matches, we are able to update the data. When it's not matched, we make an insert. So we are literally doing an upset operation on top of parquet files on the data lake. And the good thing about it is for those who don't like the, what do you say, the programmatic way that we've seen here on the left-hand side, you also get the SQL compatible way where you can do say simple things like update events at event type equal to click, where event type equal to CLCK, uh, and so on. So in terms of API wise, it is it is very user friendly. And with respect to functionality, it's really powerful because of uh, just what I've described right now. But it's not some magic bullet, right? It comes with its own caveat. Types. That's why I was saying start start caveat events. So, what kind of worries do we need to worry about? Given and specifically when we are looking at it from uh, our problem definition, right? So concurrency conflicts, even if it has you know opt uh, optimistic concurrency controls, it still can run into conflicts. So this table basically shows you uh, when it does conflict and when it does not conflict. Uh, an insert and an insert won't conflict, which is great. So it's a very good thing to note. So keep this in mind, this will be extremely useful as we go in the future slides. The next thing to worry about is the update, deletes, and merge into. So all these upsert operations or mutations, they can conflict with other upsets or mutations, as well as they can conflict with inserts. Now, these two caveats are extremely important in, when we're trying to design the system right now. So bear with me and do keep these two things in mind. The next thing is the column size. We've done a lot of experimentation. Um, most of the time, so the biggest problem happens is when an, an individual column data, right, it exceeds to 2 GB, we see a degradation in the writing performance, or we end up with out of memory uh, problems. There are, there are some things that we can do to mitigate this through more RAM or change some Spark configurations, but nevertheless, something to be aware of. The biggest thing, apart from the concurrency conflicts, is I would say the update frequency. If you make too frequent updates, so you can cause issues with the underlying file store, specifically with respect to the metadata. This is because every transaction that you do, right, when you do an update or delete or something like that, and say if you have five partitions in the parquet, right? And uh, if it affects, say, three partitions of it, what Delta internally does is it does a copy and write. So if a change affects a given partition, it would do a copy of the partition, mutate the partition with the change that you specified, and then write it back. This can cause a lot of file system operations happening in a very short amount of time, given the nature of applications. So more updates equal to more rewrites on the HDFS. And another problem can also be if you update too frequently and you don't have a good enough buffer, in that case, you're going to end up with too many small files. So these, these things are real concerns, right? So it's not just going to automatically go away. So let's look into how we're going to solve this problem, right? So the change data captures the system that we have as of now um, for our Adobe Experience platform. It goes something like this. We have a bunch of apps like you know, batch ingestion, streaming ingestion, and the API based ingest. They make change changes to the hot store that is Cosmos DB right now. Um, so they make a request uh, to the hot store. They get an app once it's succeeded. And then they emit the application emits a CDC notification uh, on the successful app. And this CDC notification goes on to this Kafka Fire Firehose, which is now consumed by various applications. Now, let's look at how this actually fits in. Right? Uh, we've gone over a bunch of issues. Now we'll see how we'll solve them. 
Uh, the first and easiest use case, right, is we have this source of truth table that is the hot, the hot store. Uh, and then we can backfill it by just doing a scan and then writing it to a raw table. The raw table, if you notice, now this is a delta table. This is a delta table on, um, say, ADLS, that is Azure Data Lake, or you could use S3 or any, any other data, data, data lake that is provided in the cloud, or your own HTFS2. Right? Uh, now, if you look at it, it differs a bit uh, than the the, the source of truth rep rep representation. Other than the primary ID and the related ID, the rest of the data that is fields one to 1000, all the nested JSON hell that we're talking about has been abstracted away into a single field called JSON string. It's basically a string column and the string, the JSON string representation of all these fields has been stuffed inside this field. We will touch upon why we do this. This is kind of an anti-pattern even from the Delta lake uh, implementation angle but we i, I promise we're going to touch that part right now so we have this delta lake uh, table which is a raw table and this is going to be a one-to-one -one mirror, mirror, mirror of the source of truth hot store that we have meaning every record in the hot store will correspond to one row in the raw table now coming to the cdc right so we have now a central cdc which is which has all the different changes uh, that has ever been made to the profile store. But because we are uh, reading from the CDC, we don't have to worry about the different writers here. So we've already solved one question now. So a CDC would look, look something like this from the initial example that we saw um, with the graph change, right? Now we have a long running Spark structure streaming application, which does, uh, let's call it a CDC dumper. Its primary job is to dump these records or append these records to a staging table, a global staging table. The, this, globing, this global staging table is partitioned by the tenant and every 15 minute interval. We will actually see in a bit why the 15 minute interval actually matters for tenant. This staging table is also a delta table. So this is useful. So the reason it's a global staging table is we don't want to be again, you know, fanning out and writing to 20 or like 100 other staging tables per 10 tenant. It's uh, Delta, 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 Delta can easily handle millions of files and tons of partitions. So, uh, and petabytes of data. So, just handling, just handling the changes uh, in one staging table should not have a big problem. Next, we have the main orchestrator of our uh, ecosystem, which is called the processor. This is again a uh, long running Spark application. It checks for any work that has to be done on the staging table for say every X minutes. It fetches records to process. So say for 10 to 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, and upsets and deletes it uh, into the raw table. And this happens on a tenant by tenant basis. Now, a question, uh, if, you, if you remember, I was, I was uh, ask, ask, asking people to remember the concurrency conflicts. Uh, by having the long running CDC dumper have up and only, even say if we have a hypothetical new process to directly write in the staging table, the writes would never conflict because it's up and only. It's inserts only. So insert would never conflict with insert. So we're good with respect to the ingestion flow over here. The next concurrency conflict that we could get is what if there is a backfill going on at the same time as uh, a Spark processor? Or what if accidentally multiple Spark processors get started for a given 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10. What the way that we solve this is by having a tenant lock. So every 10 tenant gets a lock. If the process is able to obtain a lock, in that case, it will be able to write it to the tenant. So this is why the concurrency diagram that we looked at uh, a slide before is extremely important. Now, staging tables are extremely useful. This is like an antiquated concept. Right? This is data warehousing 101. Uh, but it really has changed the game with respect to how we approach this problem, uh, given the limitations that it has, right? As in, it's not a limitation per se, it's just that the way the system is designed and we need to operate it within those limits. So the multiple source write titles, that's solved because now instead of reading from, diff from five different apps, uh, the changes have all been centralized from the CDC. 
and every single mutation will generate a CDC. So we are guaranteed to be able to replicate successfully. The staging tables are an up and only mode, so no conflicts to that. Uh, with respect to the column size problems, uh, column data size problems, uh, by passing it to the staging table, we can add a filtration component to uh, filter out any bad data. Now, the next part is uh, because we have the staging table and the processor is waking up once every few minutes or whatever interval that we configure, the staging table itself acts like a, like a large buffer, which means that we can get over the fact that we don't need to write updates too frequently. So this, is, this becomes a time aware buffer, uh, which again, solves a lot of the issues that we are talking about previously. The logical view of the staging table looks something like this, uh, because you remember I said the staging table is partitioned by tenant and uh, time intervals of 15 minutes. Now, the way uh, the time interval of 15 minutes is like, so every hour is partitioned into four quarters. So you can see uh, at 9.15 a.m. on 1st January, the first quarter, we have four CDC records and quarter two has two records and quarter three has two, two, two records. So this acts as like, you know, we have buffers in, 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 in case we end up with a huge spike of records, right? This, get, this gives us a good amount of uh, a buffer to be able to partition the records into multiple different partitions in the staging table itself. So when we want to chunk out our work, even when reading from the processor, we'll be able to say limit by the number of records that we want to read from the staging table. Now, with respect to how the processor figures out what work has to be done, uh, we maintain a central uh, store where we are able to have the map of which ten tenant and which uh, last successful TS key was done. So for tenant one, it knows that quarter one was the last successful one. So then if we see any more records after that, then we know that uh, the processor has to do more work. Now, a key thing to note is why are we using a JSON string format, right? So what we're going for is, since the schema evolution can have, keep happening all the time, we want to avoid, uh, what to say, any uh, outages that can happen because of that. So we want to take a schema on read approach. And added to the fact was nested schema evolution was not supported um, on an update in Delta in 2020. It's supported the latest version. But what happened, uh, an interesting thing happened. So while we were waiting for that feature to get implemented, uh, we thought, okay, let's try strings as the intermediate format. Uh, and then another feature that we needed was we wanted to apply conflict resolution before we did the upset. Basically, it looks something like this, right? You want to resolve and merge for a key value record, where there's a, the new data and the old data. Think of it like as a trigger uh, in, uh, RDBMSs or like, you know, uh, sprocks, like, sto like stored procedures in some no SQL databases. Now we can implement this in Spark, right? Using a UDF, but UDFs are pretty strict on types. So, and every tenant has its own schema, uh, JSON schema, which maps to another crazy uh, struct schema. And struct schemas are not that easy to manipulate. So one, we needed to create hundreds or thousands of thousands of thousands of UDFs, or we just have one single resolve and merge method which uses JSON strings. And we use the JSON iter library, which has a lazy parse function. And it's a super fast and efficient uh, Java library for JSON system processing, which makes uh, the loading of partial bits of JSON very efficient and manipulating them also very efficient. One question that I get asked all the time is, hey, you know what? Don't, 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 don't you lose predicate push to stuff. Now, what happens here is that, uh, yeah, we do lose predicate push to stuff, but we don't actually care too much about it because we've pulled all the main push down filters for to individual columns outside in the rock table, like the timestamp, record type, etc. And if you remember the, the system, the workload that I said, it does not depend on predicate push down. The query engine is efficient to run multiple queries at one time. So the scan is the main bottleneck that we have. And we actually did a lot of different uh, experiments and we noticed that reading the whole JSON string from the data lake 
is much faster and cheaper than reading from the hot store for just 20% of the fields. So that kind of settled the debate with respect to predicate questions. Another thing that I will also say is the scheme on read is a far more future safe approach for uh, the raw data that you want to store. The partition scheme is pretty simple. We have all the fields that we pulled out, we kind of have a partition based on that. One key thing to note is we also do a Z order on the primary ID. Z ordering is a proprietary feature from Databricks, which lets you co-locate column information in the same files using uh, like hint hint plots. Um, from an RDBMS point of view, think of it as a clustered index where all the data which belong to that index close by, they all are in the same partition. And basically a full re rewrite happens. Uh, we have two types of replication lags that we need to keep in mind. This entire thing is just like a the whole system that we just described is nothing but a, uh, a glorified replication system on the data lake, right? From the hot store to the data, the data lake. The first lag is the CDC lag from Kafka. So it tells us how much more work we need to do to catch up to the staging table. The second one is the per tenant lag. So we can just use the progress map that we spoke about earlier. And we can compare the timestamps to figure out how, many, how, how much more work has to be done to catch up to the hot stuff. So I want to end with talking about performance, right? So we spoke about a lot about the architecture, why we did certain decisions and so on. So, and keeping in mind the earlier use case that we're talking about with respect to the upsert and the merge performance. So we want to see for, with the live traffic use case, how long does it take? to merge or upsert uh, X number of CDC messages into the raw table with the format that we specified. So we saw a lot of um, promising performances, uh, like with the same cluster, with a very small cluster, what we were able to see is uh, like 170,000 CDC records um, got, and this basically maps to say 100,000 rows that we need to upset into just took 15 seconds. 1.7 million, so we go even more, uh, by a huge factor. In that case, it just took 661 seconds. Uh, one key thing to note is we did have to set these two features on in order to be able to get good write performance. The next thing is the workload that we spoke about, right? That's the main job. So if we made a direct comparison, the size of the data on the hot store, it was one TB. Um, as in, we, we just took one ten tenant to compare, uh, and the size of the data on the Delta Lake was just six, 64 GB. All that magic compression on the parquet layer comes into picture here. The number of partitions, 80 on the hot store, 189 on Delta. The number of cores used, we kept it constant because we didn't want to bias it towards anything else. Um, the job runtime, huge difference from three hours to 25 minutes. For larger orgs, we're going to see a lot more difference because we'll see more effective code for code, code, code research. So the takeaways from today's talk, I would say the scan IO speed from the data lake is way, way, way greater than the hot store. Because the hot store is just not meant to do that. It's more of a transactional system that we were hacking to work as a scan system. Uh, we are getting reasonably, eventually consistent replication within minutes. So it's not seconds, it's not instantaneous. But uh, the cost difference and the performance difference, definitely worth it. More partitions means Spark executed core utilization is much better. And another big thing is the potential to aggressively TTL data in the hot store. So now this, re, this makes us reevaluate what data we want to store in the hot store. And this means, and what are the next things, right? Can we materialize even more things without having to do extra computation? So. That's all that I had for today. Uh, anything more, please do reach, reach, reach out to me on email and LinkedIn. And I'll make sure that the slides are shared. Uh, thank you.